My name is Stefan Gustafsson. I come from the far north in Europe, so I live in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, I've been involved with uh, ELF since uh, the beginning of this work. And back in, in Sweden, I've been involved in student evangelism for many years and in uh, <coughs> uh, Christian apologetics training Christians, equipping Christians in this area of apologetics and doing uh, persuasive evangelism, doing outreach from an apologetic point of view in terms of a, a recent presentation of the gospel and in terms of uh, being part of public uh, debates about the truth of the gospel. So this is very close to my heart and I'm uh, really glad we have uh, such a good group of people that are interested in, in apologetics. If we go back in history to AD 33, it is really astonishing to think about the start of the Christian movement. It's absolutely surprising that this small group of people, very limited in numbers, totally limited in terms of ethnicity, very limited in terms of geography, there are 120 Jewish people in Jerusalem, and then some friends up in the Galilee. How on earth could they start a movement that within 300 years would take over the Roman Empire? How on earth did that happen? From a purely historical point of view, it's really odd and surprising. Of course, we as Christians, we, we would say, well, God raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus, the risen Jesus, went to heaven and he poured out the Spirit. That's the explanation. And of course it is. Of course, it's the resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring of the Spirit that is the uh, explanation. So the gospel just explodes in every direction. Thomas takes it to India. Philip gives it to the man from Ethiopia. Paul brings it to Europe. And the, the gospel goes out in every direction. When a historian looks at this, a historian may say, well, I'm not sure how I can take the Holy Spirit into my account. Let's put that aside for a moment. Maybe God poured out his spirit, but I, I'm not dealing with that right now. How can we then explain the growth of the Christian movement? A Cambridge scholar 100 years ago who was focusing on antiquity, the Roman Empire, and the issue about the growth of the Christian movement, he said this, Christianity was victorious because the early Christians outlived, outthought, and outdied the world around them. So he identifies three, what he says is, was key factors for the growth of the Christian movement. They outlived. They lived in a way people have not seen people live before. And what he is targeting is the love of the Christians. Actually not the love within the church, but that Christians were showing love and compassion towards people outside their own group. And that was unheard of in the Roman Empire. Of course people care for their own group, their own tribe, their own family. Why care about sick and poor and suffering people outside your own tribe? It was the love of the Christians. That's the first. Secondly, they outthought. Well, Christians were not smarter than anyone else. We are as stupid as the rest of humanity. There are no IQ differences between Christians and non-Christians, of course. But the Christians, their message was truer and more relevant than the alternatives. And the Christians were prepared to argue with the non-Christians. So they were in debates with the Jews in the synagogue about Jesus being the Messiah. They were in debates with Greek and Roman philosophers. They were in debates with uh, the Roman authorities. And they won the debates. 
they outthought their contemporaries. That is what we are going to talk about. That is apologetics. And then they outdied the world around them. They died in a way people have not seen before. When political powers are confronted with a group who does not obey, what do they do? Well, they start to put pressure on that group. They imprison them, they torture them, and ultimately they say to members of that group, if you do not obey, we will take your life. But here was a group where people answered, but I'm not living for my life. I live for something higher than my own life right now. So they couldn't pressure Christians into obedience. They died in a way they had not seen before. I think this is such a beautiful picture of the Christian movement. Love towards people outside the movement. Thinking, taking truth and reason seriously. And hope, living for something bigger than what it is now and what is my own life at the moment. Having the big picture and the, the Christian hope. And I think if we are going to see the Christian faith coming back on a broad scale in Europe again, these three things are crucial. Love, apologetics, and hope. You can add other things. I'm not saying it's only those three. There are other important things. But I think these are really important. And we are going to deal with the one, <coughs> the one in the middle they outthought. So the Christian movement took over Europe. Paul brought the gospel uh, to Europe. It spread around the Mediterranean and gradually further north and further west. The gospel came to my country during the ninth, ninth century. Some German monks were sent up to the Vikings. I don't know how happy they were about that assignment. But they were sent from Bremen in Germany to bring the gospel to the Vikings in uh, Stockholm or the island Birka. The ship uh, went down in the sea, but the two monks survived, and by foot they traveled up to uh, Stockholm and preached the gospel and started the first church. <clears throat> in some places in Europe, the gospel has been for 2,000 years. In some other places, like my country, it's been more than 1,000 years. And so the gospel has been part of the whole of Europe. Not that everyone has been a Christian and known God, of course not. Uh, there's been a lot of nominal Christianity, a lot of cultural Christianity, a lot of forced conversions. We know all the uh, troublesome aspects. But still, a Christian worldview has been at the backdrop of our culture for a very, very long time. I really like this. Uh, it's a NASA picture of uh, Europe lit up by the lights of the city. Uh, so uh, I come from up there. There you have Stockholm. I take this as a metaphor for the light of the gospel that has lit up our continent. And out from Europe, missionaries have been sent during uh, the 18th and 19th and 20th century Missionaries have been sent from Europe out to other continents where there today are huge revivals. But during the 20th century, and especially during the second half of the 20th century, something totally unexpected has happened. What has been the motherland for Christianity since the year 70, when Jerusalem fell, Europe, here the church is collapsing. And if you look at this picture and think of all the lights, if you have imagination with you and you start to see one light after another is turned off. And darkness is again spreading over Europe. That is what has happened. This was a, an article in the UK magazine, The Spectator, 
it's from 2015, 2067, the end of British Christianity. How on earth can you make that prediction? Well, it's very easy. You take the development between 2001 and 2011, and then you extrapolate. If that continues, Christianity is gone. 2067. <clears throat> Here is another uh, news article from, uh, from England. For every one person brought up in a non-religious household who starts going to church, 26 people raised as Christians turn into non-believers, a new report found. So people are coming from non-Christian backgrounds into the church. But the stream in the other direction is much, much stronger. I could continue to give you figures from a number of countries. I could give you a lot of statistics from Sweden. And the tendency is the same. I'm not interested in the details of this. You can always discuss uh, statistics and how they define uh, Christian and, and uh, so on. There are millions of questions you can uh, ask about this kind of statistics. But it's obvious that the churches are not thriving in Europe. They are going the other direction. That is the general picture. There are wonderful exceptions. We see growing churches, we see people come to faith, but the, <laughs> the, over, uh, sorry, the overall picture is not a positive one. We are struggling. And this is really surprising. What has happened? hundred years ago, no one imagined that this would be the case. hundred years ago, if I take my own country, we had had huge revivals affecting the whole country at the end of the 18th, dur uh, during uh, the 19th, and in the beginning of the 20th century. Sweden was well known as a strong missionary country. We were sending missionaries to many other countries and continents. No one expected Sweden to be the world's most secularized country, as we are often described as today. What has happened? Well, that is, of course, a complex question. And the answer is complex. You, can, you need to di discuss a number of things. But in my view, it's obvious what it is the main cause behind this. And in order to understand that, that we need to look at European history. If we simplify, and I'm very well aware I'm simplifying now, there are two root systems for European culture. We're drinking from two different wells. We're being inspired by two sets of ideas. The one well we are drinking from is the Christian faith. Jesus, of course we could start it with Abraham, but let's start with, uh, with Jesus when the, uh, the message goes out to us non-Jewish people. So, Jesus, the first apostles, the Christian movement, and it becomes the dominant view in the Roman Empire within 300 years. And from that time on, gradually, the gospel is spread and the Christian faith is accepted all over Europe. Of course, there's a lot of ups and downs. It was a huge crisis when the Roman Empire fell. Uh, there was theologically deep corruption in the time leading up to the Reformation. So there were ups and downs. There were strong revivals during the 19th century, during the 1800s, that affected many, many countries in Europe. And the year 1900. In many places, it was, of course, not an ideal situation. There were a lot of problems, and uh, uh, also within the churches, of course. But it was a strong church. What has happened since then? 
What has happened is that we have started to drink from the other well. We have started to, to be inspired by the other root system. And that goes back all the way to the Greeks. And to, to choose one philosopher, I'm, uh, I have chosen Protagoras. He is the man who formulated the sentence, man is the measure of all things. In the Christian perspective, the starting point is God. God has been there always. He's the creator. We are creatures. We are living within a creation. And we are totally dependent, uh, dependent on God. He is the authority. He is the meaning. He is the goal. He is the source. Everything is directed towards God. The whole meaning with our existence is dependent upon God. Now, humanism says, no, 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 no. Man is the measure of everything. Man is the authority. Man is the meaning for himself. Man can define life. There is nothing and no one beyond man. That is humanism, which we can find amongst the old Greeks. Of course, we can find it all the way back to Genesis 3. But... Uh, we find it amongst um, Greek philosophers. In Europe, during the Renaissance, some of the thinkers come in contact with the Greek thinking, starting to read Greek philosophers in the original languages and becoming inspired by some of their perspective, but still holding on to a, a Christian faith, but letting some inspiration come from this other perspective. And then during the Enlightenment, a small intellectual elite in Europe consciously shifted root systems, decided to drink from the other well. Rejecting God, of course that was a pro process, first not rejecting the existence of God, but rejecting God's involvement and presence in the world, and then rejecting his existence altogether. But the end result, was that they rejected the Christian faith. That did not affect people on the ground. On the ground now, there were strong revivals coming. People still believed in God. People had respect for the word of God, respect for the church. But something has, has happened on the level of the elite. And that which affected the elite during the Enlightenment, has now taken over our culture. That is the main reason behind secularism. And the key event is the Enlightenment, man as the measure of all things. What was the response from the churches towards this? It was a main attack on the Christian faith. What was the response from the churches? Well, there were basically two responses. One response was to <clears throat> adjust the Christian faith. Basically saying, yeah, you're right. We cannot longer believe in God, in a creator God. We cannot believe in miracles any longer. Let's adjust the Christian faith. And that is what we today call liberal theology, where you have Christian language, you use Christian words, but you do not believe any longer in miracles like the virgin birth or the resurrection of Jesus or the miracles that uh, we have in the Gospels or you don't believe in prophecy or the inspiration of scriptures, but you retain a Christian language and you focus on the ethical aspects of loving your neighbor or respecting other people or the, the dignity of everyone. So you're taking some ideas from the Christian faith and making them into the whole Christian faith. And it, it leads to this kind of, of uh, things. Uh, BBC, 2017. Resurrection did not happen, say, quarter of Christians. So people who identify themselves as Christians still say that the resurrection of Jesus did not happen. That is, of course, a result of liberal theology, that people can imagine themselves being Christian, but still 
denying what is defining Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus. Liberal theology has undermined so much of the Christian faith in Europe. And it's a key factor between, behind the weakness of the churches here. The other response came from the more Bible-believing, the revival part of the church, pietism, and later on Pentecostalism and charismatics, where people say, we don't need to deal with intellectual questions and with philosophy, and why bother about this? We should preach the gospel and rely on the Holy Spirit. That, that's it. The Christian faith is about experiences God. Now, there's a lot of truth in this, that, of course, we should preach the gospel and rely on the Holy Spirit. And since God is a living God, you can experience God. So I'm not denying any, any of those things. But the enormous weakness was to say, therefore, we should not deal with intellectual questions. So they left enlightenment thinking unchallenged. And that worked well for a time, because the majority of Christians were not really confronted by enlightenment thinking. But not, it did not work for very long. So it was a grave mistake to ignore the intellectual challenges. So I've, I've said that it is the enlightenment thinking that gradually has trickled down and taken over our culture. Can we say anything about, about that process? How did that happen, that the Enlightenment thinking took over the thinking of the population? I would say that the educational system is a key factor here, the educational system. If I take my father, my own father, as an example, when he was young, the normal thing in Sweden was that you went six years in school, and then off to work. That was the normal thing. It was just a small, small percentage that studied more than six years. During those six years, every day started with a psalm, a hymn. You prayed in the classroom, and you studied the Christian faith together with other things. So you had six years with presence of Christianity in the classroom during those six years. Now, what has happened since then? Now. If I take my own country, Sweden, everyone goes nine year. Nearly everyone, like 95%, continues three more years, that's 12 years. And over 50% of today's generation continues on to universities. Three, four, five, six years. It means that the majority of people are not six years in the educational system, but between 15 and 20 of their most formative years. And now, there is no presence of the Christian faith, now the educational system is filled with criticism and dismissal of the Christian faith. This is a key factor behind secularization. A researcher in Sweden, <clears throat> this is from her um, a PhD dissertation, was investigating the attitude towards religion in the educational system in Sweden. <clears throat> and here is what she says. The findings indicate that the secularist discourse was hegemonic in the classroom practice. Religions and worldviews were seen as something outdated and belonging to history. A non-religious, atheistic position was articulated as neutral and unbiased in relation to the subject matter and was associated with being a rational, critically thinking person. And in other passages, she talks about the Enlightenment perspective being dominating. So, now what people are learning through school is that previous we were Christian, but we had moved on. We had left that because we are more advanced now. We have more science now. So that belongs to the past. Now we are secular people, and that is associated with being a rationally, critically thinking person. Now, that is in the educational system for between 15 and 20 years for today's generation. Can you see that it was a mistake to say we should not engage in intellectual questions? <laughs> when the whole culture turns against 
the Christian faith. <clears throat> this means that someone being raised in a Christian family or in a connection with the Christian church comes under severe pressure. Practically, it means that during your upbringing, you will constantly hear two voices. You will hear one beautiful voice from your family and from the church. And that voice, or at least the message, regardless of the voice, the message is beautiful. That message says, there is a God. There is a God who has created us. He wants us to live. There is meaning to our life. He is a God of love and of mercy. He has shown his love to us. In giving us his son, Jesus Christ, he has died for our sins. We can have forgiveness and freedom and hope. You should think big of your life. You can become a child of God. You're called to serve God. You can make a difference. Pray to him. He listens. He gives a response. He does not always answer the way you, uh, you want, maybe. But he actually gives you a response. Study his words. He will speak to you. He will guide you. He will encourage you. Have a huge perspective. This it's just the beginning, a preparation for a wonderful future. Okay, a message filled with hope and meaning and love. And then you have another voice, which actually comes, you hear it much more often, because it's every day in school, it's every day in media and on, on the internet and in the entertainment. And that voice says, no, sorry, there is no God. We thought that previously, but no. So we are alone in the universe. It's just a coincidence that we exist. No one has meant your life. When you die, everything is just over. Make the best you can of your life as long as you have it. No, it does not make any difference to pray. There is no one to hear, listen, or respond. Come on, you cannot have a book from antiquity as your authority. That is just to humiliate yourself as a human being. Use your own mind. Those who wrote the Bible, they were ignorant people, filled with prejudices. Why should you subject yourself to a book from antiquity? Okay, two very different voices. What's happening and what has happened and what is the main reason behind the struggle within the churches is that this causes cognitive dissonance within people. Dissonance is when it's, dis it's not harmony. Uh, if you take um, uh, on a keyboard and the, the notes does not fit together, it's disharmony dissonance. Cognitive is, is the mind, the thinking. When you have two ideas that, that's, that does not fit together, then we have an inbuilt tendency to create harmony in our thinking. And the only way to do that is to dismiss one idea to fully embrace the other. So this is like standing uh, with uh, one feet in one boat and the other in another. And you can do that for some time, but not too long. Sooner or later, the two boats are sliding apart, and you will have a real problem. And the only way to solve that problem is to move so you have both your feet in one boat. And what has happened is that people have moved to the secular boat, because no one has showed them that there are good reasons to stand in the boat of the gospel. <clears throat> Why do we need apologetics? Why do we need a recent defense of the faith? 
from a pragmatic level, I think it's absolutely obvious the Christian church have been attacked intellectually for 200 years in Europe. And that attack has gone uh, through the educational system and is thereby affecting everyone. It's a dead end street to adjust the Christian faith to enlightenment thinking, like the liberal theology. Those churches are dying out. But it is also a huge mistake to ignore those issues. What is needed is a response to enlightenment thinking, where enlightenment thinking is challenged and where we start to give a recent presentation for the truth of the Christian faith. And that is what apologetics is all about. So, just to end my presentation here, I've mentioned the word apologetics a number of times. If we uh, define it, it goes back to a Greek word, apologia, which comes from the legal setting, from the courtroom. In an ancient court, you had an accuser, like in a modern court, who presented a categoria, the accusation. You have killed Mr. X. And these are the arguments for why we think you are the murderer. That is the categoria. But then, the accused one was allowed to give his or her defense. And that was called an apologia. No, I did not kill Mr. X. At the time of the murder, I was in another city. And I have a number of people uh, uh, with me who can uh, ensure you that I was there when Mr. X was killed here. You could put forward your defense. So basically, apologetics has to do with defense. But the word apologia, which we find actually 18 times in the New Testament, it has also a broader meaning of giving an answer, to motivate, to give an argument. So it's not only a legal setting of giving a defense in a court, but also to answer questions or to motivate or explain how something uh, is. So that is apologetic. And that is what the churches should have used when the Enlightenment thinking became the accuser, saying no rational person can be a Christian any longer, then we should have given a defense, showing the weakness of their accusation and showed the strength of the Christian faith. The most famous word in, uh, or, or text in the New Testament about this is 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Always be prepared to give an answer, there you have apologia, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And there Peter is using the word logos, which we have in the word logic. So always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason, the logic for your hope.